Let's pray, please. To you be the honor and glory, dear God, our Father. And our earnest prayer at this time is that you would consume us with your Holy Spirit, each and every one of us, that you would open the eyes and ears of our hearts, that we would learn new lessons, that we would grow in old ones that we have retained, that you would be very well pleased. Speak not just to me, I pray, but to all of us here this morning and to those who will bear witness to your word and this message at this time in this church, who will be watching it and listening to it on the internet. Please, O oh God, pierce their hearts and minds as well with your glorious truth and the awesome and holy and revered, reverend name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. well, last week, shortly after Kristen and I arrived here at the church, uh, Pancho and Gloria and Rhonda, uh, they showed up as well. And Pancho, he sat in the seat where he is right now, his normal seat, and uh, as I was walking back and forth, uh, Pancho pulled me aside and he told me this. He said, in the bulletin this morning, it says that our Bible reading is Luke 15, 8 to 10. And I just opened up my Bible and there it was, the exact chapter, and my eyes went to the exact verse. Isn't that the truth, Pancho? Yep. How about that? Some people will call that uh, chance. I call it the providence of God. But I'm not finished yet. You see, after worship, he came up here to the chancel area, and he said to me this. He said, when you talked about the darkness today, that's where I was before I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I was living in the darkness. And for some reason, I came here. And as we prayed together, meaning me, Pancho, and Dave, when I asked Jesus into my heart, I was in the light. I saw and I knew, and I am clean. Brothers and sisters, that's what's ha that is what happens when we come to Jesus Christ in repentance and when we are saved. We come to the line. We go out from the darkness. We get away from the darkness. We leave the darkness behind and we enter into the light. And yes, we become new. We become clean. When we truly, honestly, sincerely, authentically repent and believe the good news, we not only see the lines, we live in the lines. And that brings us this morning to our passage for today. As Jesus and his disciples were traveling to Jerusalem, three men came up to him. Two of them said that they will follow Christ, would follow Christ. They just said, I will follow you. One said, I'll follow you wherever you go. And the other one said, I will follow you, Lord. The other, Christ told the man to follow him. So each of the men speak briefly with the Lord, and this is how things went. The first man to speak with Christ was a scribe. How do we know that? Luke doesn't tell us that. Ah, oh, but Matthew does in the same passage in Matthew 8, 19. He says to Jesus, this man says to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. In other words, I am all in for you, Jesus. I am all in for you. I will do anything. I will go anywhere. I will weather any storm. I will face any challenge. If only I can be your disciple. Now Jesus, who knew everything and knows everything, knew this man's heart, and he replied, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. In other words, Mr., following me is not going to be easy. In fact, it's going to be very difficult. There are going to be long days and cold nights. We'll be sleeping on the ground most of the time. Many nights, your pillow, you know what that will be, mister? That your pillow will be a rock. And fresh water, well, that's not going to be abundant every day either. 
There will be days when we don't have much to eat. And you will be spending most of your time in the heat. We will be on the move almost every day. And many people around us will hate us. And some will even try to kill us. And as for me, well, I will accept nothing less than complete 100% surrender. You want to follow me, you must give me all of yourself. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. You see, following me will mean more than spending a little time away from your family. It will cost you your life. And one more thing, there's no going back. Once you give your life to me, you are mine forever. So, before you tell me you're going to follow me wherever I go, know the cause. Then along comes the second man. And unlike the first man, this man knows who Jesus really is. How do we know that? Well, he calls Christ. Lord. Of course, Jesus knows that this man knows that he is Lord. He, he knows it intellectually. And Christ tells this man, he says, follow me. And what's the first thing out of this man's mouth? He says, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. Again, this man knew who Jesus was. He knew Jesus was Lord. But brothers and sisters, please understand this. There is a huge difference between knowing who Jesus is and knowing Jesus himself. There's a huge difference between knowing that Jesus is Lord and knowing Jesus as Lord. That's why, instead of answering the call, this man comes up with an excuse. You see, he wasn't about to commit his entire life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He knew it, and Jesus knew it. So he came up with what he thought, what he thought with what he thought would be a real winner. He said, "Quote, Lord, permit me first and go to go bury my father." But there's a problem with that. What's the problem? His father wasn't dead. His father wasn't dead. In fact, back then, the phrase, I must bury my father, was a common figure of speech. What it really meant is this. Let me wait until I receive my inheritance. That's what it meant. In other words, the man was saying, when my dad does die, and I receive my inheritance, I'll be in a much better financial position to be your disciple. How about it, Lord? Lord, I know who you are, but give me some time to live my life on my own terms before I live my life for you. Jesus says to the man, allow the dead to bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Now, when Christ said, allow the dead to bury their own dead, this is what he meant. He meant, let the world, the spiritually dead, take care of the insignificant mundane things. The things that are here today and that are gone tomorrow. My disciples take care of the spiritual, eternal things. And brothers and sisters, that is really what Christianity is all about. It's not about the temporal things. It's about the eternal things, spiritual things. Yes, we are called to help other people, practically speaking. Of course we are. Jesus has commanded us to do so. We are to be kind to people, to be generous to people, to be loving to people, to be gracious to people, to be helpful to people, to reach out to other people. Yes, yes, yes. To support them, to encourage them, to lift them up, especially the hurting, the helpless, the hopeless, those in great need. Yes. But even those endeavors should direct people to the spiritual. You see, everything we do as Christians should direct others toward the eternal. The eternal through Jesus Christ. 
The Lord makes this crystal clear in Matthew 6, 19 to 21 when he says this. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So, if your treasure, if my treasure, is in the things of this world, in these temporary things that are here today and gone tomorrow, if that's where our treasure lies, then that's where our focus will be, and that's where our hearts reside as well. And if your treasure, if my treasure, is in heaven, meaning the, focused on the eternal things, the things that really matter in life, that is where our focus will be. That is where our hearts will be. And that is what we will live for. Brothers and sisters, if our hearts are in the world, then the stuff that is here today and gone tomorrow is indeed what we live for. But if our hearts are in the spiritual, the eternal, then the things that last forever are what we will live In John 17, 16, Jesus Christ is praying to the Father. And as a part of that prayer, he says these, he prays these words. Quote, They, meaning you and me, believers, followers of Christ, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Christ was telling the second man, let those who live for the world take care of the temporary stuff. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. See, that's the eternal. And that is exactly what you and I are called to do. This well. Which brings us to the third. He too knew that Jesus was Lord, but he too did not know Christ as Savior. This fellow says, I will follow you, Lord, but, there's that but, but, first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. And Christ replies, no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, if you think about it, this man's request, at first, it sounds pretty reasonable, doesn't it? Let me go home and say goodbye to those, that, you know, my family members and friends and all that. But Christ knew the man's heart and knew his mind. The man knew it too. And both Christ and that man knew that once he went back home, he was never coming back. I mean, think about it. When Christ called the twelve disciples, do you remember what they did? Did they set up a committee to look into it? Did they ask permission to go home and say goodbye to their friends and relatives? No. Did they make some excuse? No. What did they do? Exactly, Rebecca. They dropped their nets and followed him. Think about that imagery, brothers and sisters, of dropping their nets. That's what they did for a living. That was their livelihood. When they dropped their nets, they dropped their livelihood. They left everything behind to follow Jesus Christ. They left family, they left friends, they left jobs, they left every material possession they owned, and they moved forward in their futures with Jesus Christ. They left it all behind to follow forward with the Savior. To move forward with the Savior. But, but the third man in our story, he comes up with an excuse. Tried to get out of it. Make it sound really good, you know. Oh, he knew it and Jesus knew it. So the Lord says, no one after putting his hands to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. No one. In other words, Christ was saying this. When you commit to following me, there's no looking back. 
Our mission together is a forward mission. It's a mission about the future, not the past. It's about plowing forward on the straight and narrow, not looking back, not looking in the past, not looking behind you, which causes you to zigzag all over the place. If you want to follow me, it's a forward mission. It's a full steam ahead mission. Do you all remember that church in Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3? The Christians there were apathetic. They were neither hot nor cold. They were lukewarm, remember? They were wishy-washy. Never making any real commitment to Jesus Christ. Oh, they came to worship on Sunday mornings, but they never truly decided for Christ. See, they were motionless. They were just there. Sure, they said they were Christians, but they did nothing to prove it. They did nothing to show it. They didn't bear any real fruit. Do you remember the consequences of their apathy? Christ said, quote, So because you were lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. By the way, the Greek word there for spit means vomit. I'm about to throw you up out of my mouth. Brothers and sisters, please understand that if there is one thing God has no patience for, it is a wishy-washy Christian. Someone who calls themselves a Christian, but really isn't. A person who says they believe in Christ. Oh yeah, they, they get baptized, they join the church, and what changes in their lives? Nothing. Or almost nothing. They go about living just as they did before. But please understand this, Christ will not have any part of a person like that. They know who they really are, and so does Jesus. And speaking of Jesus, listen to the demands he puts on his real followers. Ready? Luke 9, 23. If anyone comes after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Meaning this. We must obey His commandments. We must be willing to suffer on His behalf and possibly even die for His sin. That's what He's saying. Luke 14, 26. Christ says, If anyone comes to Me and does not hate his own father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Meaning this. We must have such a devotion to Jesus Christ that our attachment to anything and everything else, anything and everything, including our own lives, would seem like hatred in comparison. That's what he's saying. Luke 14.33, Jesus says, None of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Meaning this, our commitment to Christ must be without any reservation whatsoever. And Matthew 10, 38, Jesus says this, He who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Meaning this. Jesus Christ doesn't ask for it. He demands. He demands total, complete, unconditional, 100% commitment to Him, even unto physical death. And that is what He's saying. That is what it takes, brothers and sisters, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ right now. Complete unadulterated, total, 100% commitment, even unto death. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul tells us to, quote, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves, exclamation mark. And that is what we need to do. 
We need to ask ourselves this morning, right now, how committed am I to Jesus? How devoted am I to truly, really truly now, being His disciple? Am I willing to sacrifice for Him? If so, how much? Am I willing to give up everything and follow Him? Everything? Can Jesus count on me to fearlessly, fearlessly stand up for Him in a society that firmly stands against Him? How much of ourselves will we give for the One, the One who has given all of Himself us. Brothers and sisters, please, please understand this. God has not put us on this earth for our own pleasure. God has put us on this earth for His pleasure. Life is not about us pleasing ourselves. Life is about us pleasing Him. Life is not about us giving ourselves glory and honor and praise. Life is about us giving Him glory and honor and praise. That's why He has us here. Not for us, but for Him. So, how committed are you? How committed am I to Him? How committed are we really, truly, authentically to living for Christ and Christ alone as long as we live on this earth? How? How much? Are, how, how? How committed are we? See, that's what each of us needs to answer. Which brings us back to our story from scriptures today. The Bible tells us that on his way to Jerusalem, three men came up to Jesus. Two of, them, two of them told him that they would follow him. One of them Christ told to follow him. And all three made excuses and backed down. So what does this story have to do with you and me? We too have told Christ we will follow him. We have. We have on multiple occasions. We sang it. We told him in prayers. We told him out loud when we gave our lives to Christ. We told him when we joined the church. And he has told us what that means. We just read it. The question for us today is, did we mean it when we said it? Or did we not? If our answer to that question is yes, then please remember this. He who is the truth knows the truth. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we have told you that we will follow you, and you have told us what that means. May our commitment to you be real. May it be real, may it be firm, may it be strong. May it be so strong that it is unshakable and unbreakable. And throughout each and every day you have us on this earth, we pray, please, please keep our eyes fixed on you. Please keep us from being deceived or distracted. Please use us as your servants. Please move us forward in our faith. And may we never, ever, ever look back or lose our way. From this day forth and forevermore, Lord Jesus, may you and you alone be our highest priority and our deepest desire. In your glorious name we pray. Amen.